Hi, I'm Tara Robertson, and I'm on the diversity and inclusion team. For those of us here in the Mozilla office, I want to acknowledge that we're on Indigenous land. This is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the New First Credit, sorry, New Credit First Nation. One of my personal commitments to reconciliation with First Nations is to learn whose land I'm on while I travel across Turtle Island. And now on to why we're all here. When I met Yuta a few years ago, her ideas completely changed how I saw the world. Yuta's ideas have changed how I approach design, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion. Inviting her here to Mozilla has been a delightful collaboration between David Bolter, Diane Tate, and me. We're all interested in how Yuta's ideas can help us build a more inclusive culture and better products that are accessible to more people so that we can get closer to ensuring the internet is a global public resource, open and accessible to all. I also wanna give a shout out to Andy Kay at Airmo and Tony Resendez at AV Ops for their awesome work in making the lab. Over to David. I'll be quick. Um, I got involved in accessibility 23 years ago. Uh, Yuda's to blame. Uh, I think she's celebrating 25 years since she created her group at the University of Toronto at the time. Uh, and a fun story there is she took a, took the job at U of T in 1993 to make an accessible lab at the university. And to give you a sense of how Yuda rules, she on her first day went to the VP and said, this is a stupid idea. We, <laughs> we should be uh, proactive and she and make accessible labs everywhere. So she got permission to fundraise and make a proactive lab. And I joined that two years later. And then uh, 13 years later, I joined Mozilla and I, I've been heavily involved in accessibility here. So please give a warm, oh, one more thing. Uh, she's got a Wikipedia entry. I, I could go on about awards and, you know, when you see a Wikipedia page and it says, here's a sampling of keynotes, you know, you're in for a good talker. Um, so yes, please give you a warm welcome. Oh gosh, <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to Mozilla. I, I've always thought that Mozilla is sort of a, a kindred spirit in terms of uh, the goals that we have at the IDRC in terms of inclusive design and in terms of where the internet should be going and where the web should be going. So today, um, I'm, my topic is called Unlearning to Include and Innovate. And I'm a professor, but um, I am quite enamored of unlearning to make room for new ideas. And as David said, um, the Inclusive Design Research Center is 25 years old, and we're gonna be celebrating October uh, 13th, and you're all welcome to the birthday party. We promise there will be cake. But one of the main things that, um, that comes of being 25 years, is that we have uh, had lots of years, many years, to learn and unlearn from our mistakes and failures. So we've, we've had the opportunity to make far more mistakes and failures than I think some um, less mature companies or organizations. And what I wanna do today is discuss with you the possibility of questioning two beliefs that I think you all hold, whether you know it or not. And these are, um, beliefs that are so enmeshed in many of the assumptions we make, many of the tools we use, much of what we learn, much of what our decision making, even our sense of what we intuit or what um, we believe. They're brilliant ideas. They are fundamental principles. They're, as I said, inextricably enmeshed in our worldview. And they've to, if we speak as a society, they formed our notions of truth and value. And they've shaped, and you can see the traces of them in education, in business, in markets, in design, in public policy. All of the things that surround us are the context of our society. And to some extent, they represent some turning points in the history of innovation. 
both of the ideas come from uh, the first wave of big data, which was in the 1800s when demographics rose and we were beginning to gather data on humans. And the reason why I've learned to question these or try to unlearn them or at least become conscious of when I use them is um, because I had um, a very personal, pivotal, instructive failure that happened. And this, the, this instructive failure happened at a time that we were working with the Ministry of Transportation trying to determine and, and plan how they were going to use the next 100 years because it was also their birthday, their 100th anniversary. And so as part of that, working with the Ministry of Transport, I was able to play with a number of machine learning engines that would make the decisions and inferences for what a car would do at an intersection. And I thought, oh, this is fun. Um, let's see what types of decisions these machine learning engines will make. And what I took to those machine learning engines was a capture of a friend of mine, actually two friends of mine, who traverse through intersections going backwards. And they're, it's very erratic. They uh, push themselves with their feet. They're very fast. They're very... Um, also fairly accurate, but people in the intersections don't necessarily predict that. And quite often a human will come and grab them, turn them around and try to push them back on the sidewalk. So I thought, okay, this is um, something that is unexpected. How will these um, machine learning engines fare? And um, what happened was all of the machine learning engines, um, all of the machine models that were used to make decisions at intersections would run them over. And I was told, don't worry, these are immature learning models. Um, we're going to add a whole bunch of data regarding uh, how people in wheelchairs traverse through intersections, come back when they have gained greater wisdom and understanding of intersections. And um, But when I came back, lo and behold, what happened was they ran them over with greater confidence. And that made me think. Um, and it made me think, well, why is this happening? Why is a smarter machine learning engine more likely to run over my friends? Um, and I went back to look at data that I had gathered in the 80s, where I had been playing with a um, hidden Markov model to recognize dysarthric speech, dysarthric speech that was repeatable. So these were individuals who, who could say many things, and their family and friends who were familiar with them would understand them, but strangers would not. And I had the data to show how quickly we could get to 200 utterances remembered or recognized. And... Um, what I discovered is that progress is not always helpful. The early speech recognition system went fairly quickly to those 200 repeatable utterances because it, um, there wasn't data to overwhelm it. But when I tried it with the um, existing very, very smart, very fast, very efficient, and very effective speech recognition engines, they never reached recognition because the models that were there for my friends were fighting the pervading data. And that led to thinking about, of course, research AI bias. And there's a lot of really great data on this. Um, there's a, a lot of individuals who are now looking at AI ethics. Um, and there's many books that have come out. This particular diagram that I'm showing, and I will show some diagrams during my presentation, but um, for those of you who can't see the diagrams or graphics, I will explain them. Um, but this particular diagram is done by Microsoft, looking at the various forms of AI um, bias. And of course, there are quite a number, but um, I was thinking there's more to this than that. It's not just an AI problem. So I wanted to see, well, where did this particular problem that we have come from? And um, I traced it back to that first idea that I would like you to question. Um, and that is the Ketele. Um, and how many of you here know of Ketele and his uh, brilliant innovation? No? Okay. So he was an astronomer back in those 1800s who, uh, he was Belgian, and he um, uh, 
was very inconvenienced by the chaos and complexity of humans. He had built an, a, a lovely observatory, and because of the, the war in Belgium, um, it was keeping him from uh, studying further. And so he, he was also an admirer of Newton, and he decided that what he wanted to do is find a, a universal law to apply to human society. And he decided he would apply the mathematics of astronomy to human data, the Gaussian curve. And you probably have all encountered the Gaussian curve in school when you were looking at the bell curve. Um, and the primary idea that he had is he wanted to avoid the chaos and the complexity that is part of human society. So he invented something called the average man. And what he decided was that the individual person, all of us, are synonymous with error. We are all representative of error from the ideal, which is the average person, the true human being. And he said some fairly shocking things at that time. Well, at that time, they weren't that shocking. Now they seem shocking. Everything differing from average man's proportions and condition would constitute deformity and disease. Everything found dissimilar, not only as regarded proportion or form, but as exceeding the observed limits would constitute a monstrosity. If an individual at any given epoch of society possessed the qualities of the average man, he would represent all that is great, good, and beautiful. And so what we did back then was we demonized diversity and we valorized conformity. And it was very convenient because at the same time we had the Industrial Revolution, we had the need for um, very, very uh, sophisticated military strategy, and th that particular idea was, was quite useful at the time. And it fed very much into taming inconvenient human variability through things like genocide, camps, madhouses, penal system schooling. Our, um, many of our uh, original institutionalized schools came about. And while we have become more civilized and we probably would not espouse those particular ideas, I think uh, given our epidemics of bullying, there is still that, that thread under the veneer of civility. And I would ask you to um, ask yourself or think the next time you use average, normal, majority, most, typical, common statistics show, it's peppered throughout almost every conversation. In fact, I was back in the lunchroom just now and I heard th those words quite a number of times. Um, the other... The second idea was um, came about through another instructive failure that was much closer to home, and that um, I took much um, with. Well, it, it pointed very, very directly to me. Um, one of the things that I've been working on for many, many years is in accessibility, whether it's with the Web Accessibility Initiative, of course, the IDRC, et cetera. And um, I was, again, with a friend who was non-speaking, and we went into a, a business um, here in the city of Toronto, a business that was... Uh, marked on all of the geospatial maps that we've created about where accessible businesses are as uh, uh, a well high performing five star accessible business. My friend, however, and they, the business was using voice recognition as their only way of opening a file. And so we went to the business. I said, they're going to be reasonable with this ability. And um, I was shocked because the business says it must be your problem. We checked all the boxes. We're completely accessibility compliant. We've spent a ton of time and money here. I can show you uh, the amount that we've spent on consultants who give us these certificates that we are accessible. And so that led me to think, well, wait a sec. What, what's gone wrong here? What have we done? Um, and how do we prioritize? And that led me to looking at um, all of the our various partners who uh, have the good intention of 
being accessible, of being inclusive, of being a good business, um, a ethical business. And one of the things that I found, a thread that went throughout all of them, was some notion that came from Pareto. And Pareto, you may not know the name Vilfredo Pareto, but he's the one that has been advising us regarding the secret to success by achieving more with less. And um, his particular lesson was that 20% of the efforts can come up with 80% of the results. He was um, he advised some of the leaders in Europe and made the point that 20% of the populace owns 80% of the land, and therefore those are the only ones you really need to care about. Um, he categorized people into the trivial many and the vital few. And the idea was, and we've sort of reinterpreted this to mean that um, with the help of Richard Koch, who wrote a book in the last century um, called the 80-20 principle, that there is a magic formula, that we can have a quick win, win that there are low-hanging fruits, if, um, and that's what you need to, to find in order to gain success. It's the best way to beat the system. It's the way that we get easy profit. And in fact, um, what you probably can't read in that picture was the 80% Twenty principle, like the truth, can make you free. You can work less at the same time. You can earn more and enjoy more. The only price is that you need to do some serious 80-20 thinking. Well, I, I would suggest that perhaps there is a greater price than that to pay. Um, and uh, one of the things that I learned is it's very, very inextricably woven into our UX dogma. Um, we think about 80-20 variables such as the user tasks, the user volume, the usage. Um, we, it's very much inextricably woven into our notion of impact and how we prioritize what we focus on. And that made me think a little bit more about what are the other rules that, or the other notions and beliefs that came about in that same century. And it made me think back to the first law of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy. Who pays for the cost of the free 60%? Um, and if you prefer Milton Friedman, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Of course, I don't prefer Milton Friedman, but anyways, I'll get back to that. Um, and uh, I found a lot of discussion of this notion of full costing and externalities. The environmental movement is far further than the accessibility movement, but to some extent, we're learning from their successes and failures. And there is this notion of full costing uh, within the environmental movement. What is the cost of those environmental quick fixes, quick wins? Um, and then what, is, what are the social impacts of, this, of the social quick wins? Um, I, I loved uh, a particular exercise that a school is doing um, as a way to teach don't pee in the pool that you swim in. They filled a pool with the plastics and then had kids swim through them. But the, the same lesson holds. What is happening when we decide not to pay attention to the 20% when we say, let's do 20% of the effort to get the 80% of the customer base and we can, we can um, leave those 20% to the side. The, those two ideas that I was talking about that I want you to rethink or to question filter into other ideas. And if you look at who influences who and what we pay attention to and what we prioritize, it affects things like our, um, focusing on survival of the fittest and not the importance of genetic choices brought about by the relaxation of natural selection. In fact, Darwin's primary idea was its choice, its variability, its diversity, its biodiversity that allows us to evolve. It's the big focus is not on that survival of the fittest. It doesn't really matter that we have that survival of the fittest. What matters is that we have choice and that we can evolve, choices that we can evolve to. And Terence Deacon is someone that's um, taken that idea further to look at how did we develop language? How did we 
evolve at each point. It's made us focus more on the rugged individualism in the US and not the health of the commons expressed in we the people. It's made us look more at the rule of, of the majority and not in inalienable rights and freedoms in things like our notions of democracy. And it um, feeds into this culture of the vital few, the popular, uh, the winner takes all competition, the popularity echo chambers, the opinion bubbles. And for whatever strange reason here in Canada and Ontario, we seem to like things like the dragon's den and the, uh, we prepare our young for the slaughter of the startup culture, etc. It has permeated almost everything. And, and whenever I do this sort of audit of where are these ideas coming from and what am I saying, I keep catching myself. So we've, we've developed myths. People can be treated as a mass. Most people are represented by the notion of the average human. If necessary, categories based on single characteristics can be used to, to sort humans. Reductionism is necessary and holds no appreciable risk. We must determine a best or winning approach. Impact should be measured based on the largest homogeneous numbers. And this myth we're starting to deconstruct. You can predict the future based on the past. Machines are objective. And to some extent, we are still, however, reliving that myth of the mechanical objectivity, which happened in that same 18th century. So my insight in noodling this a lot over the last little while and watching and, and reflecting on what I'm doing is that um, if we take any population, this population here, it looks like a starburst. It's a Gaussian curve, it's a normal distribution. But the thing to note about that starburst is there's a cluster that are very, very densely together in the middle. And then the rest of the dots or the rest of the elements, data elements spread out from that. And um, if you look at the, those that are not right in the center, they are more different than the ones that are in the middle. And that has a lot to, to do with um, what we need to do in terms of inclusive design. And my biggest concern, oops, sorry, I'm behind a bit, was what do we do with those individuals who are at that very jagged edge? And I'll tell you why you need to be concerned and why those people at the very jagged edge are important, despite what Pareto was saying. There is an injustice at that very edge. There is the injustice of the mar market and the minority. Individuals with disabilities are people that are different and there are other people that are different. And I'll tell you a little later what we mean by people with disabilities. Um, in the scatter plot of human needs, I'm very, very concerned about what happens to those individuals that we within the IDRC define as individuals that require or that require inclusive design. We design everything, and I think here as well um, at Mozilla for largely for the average or for what we think are those vital few. If you are in that very jagged edge, products are not made for you. Any that are made for you cost more. You have less degrees of freedom to adapt to a design that doesn't fit, and it's more important that the design is optimized for you. And so what we're creating is we're creating a widening gap. If we take that Gaussian curve and we look at it like a scatter plot or like a starburst, um, whether it's our design, our products, our knowledge, truth and evidence, our education, our work, our democracy, in every case we are separating those that are the 20 and those that are the 80 and creating this rift. Um, the... Uh, Design it with respect to that edge is a misfit. And of course, the design for the, the, the 80% is a fit. The products uh, that are designed for individuals that are at that edge are reducing in availability, reliability, availability, and but at the same time, increasing in cost. The knowledge, truth, and evidence individuals who are at the edge are ignored. Um, they're not recognized and they're not understood. The 
education and I mean, you can probably <laughs> continue the narrative. It, it affects our education, it affects our work, it also affects our democracy. If you look at the last few elections, um, think about the minority needs that are essential. Um, what is the likelihood that if I have a child that requires an essential service, that I'm going to get the appropriate politician elected that is taking care of that child versus someone who, like the majority of their neighbors, has a pothole that needs fixing in front of their house. It's highly, it's much more likely that we'll fix the pothole or the, uh, the politician that will promise to fix the pothole will get in. And I know there's these, oh, I'm not going to talk about democracy or any contentious issues, so I will talk about UX design and, and design. But um, the 2080 rule also, of course, caused causes that a rift. It results in mass production, mass communication, mass marketing, um, a popularity push. And Unfortunately, it also has the cost of compromising innovation um, because uh, we're reducing flexibility, we're reducing extensibility, we're, we're reducing responsiveness and resilience, we're causing lock-in um, because we are uh, focusing and reducing continuously. And the approach that we've been taking to individuals with disabilities have also to some extent been guided by that 2080 rule. Um, often, I mean, accessibility is dealt with in a few ways. It's an afterthought, and so we bolt on um, the, the accessibility requirements after the product has already been made. And we all know that retrofitting costs so much more than proactive accessibility. Um, or we treat people with disabilities as segregated and special. Um, and we create a separate product, which it has uh, a reduced lifespan. Or we treat individuals with disabilities as another mass, and we create a one-size-fits-all. Remember that scatter plot where individuals who are with disabilities are very, very different from each other. Or the other approach that we take is we corral people into categories and then we create another mass, another smaller mini 80-20 and we treat the individuals um, with disabilities that have high incidence disabilities first and we uh, think of or we leave the others to the end if we actually ever address the needs of, of individuals who are in the minority. All of that has huge repercussions. Um, it has repercussions for the individual at the edge. It has repercussions for you because the, I mean, the story, I'm 60, so I'm going to be, um, I'm learning more and more that even if you happen to be part of that lucky 80 or that vital few, um, you can at any time when you least expect it with the greatest probability, it's the one thing that you can predict that you're going to fall out of that category. And it's not going to be a soft landing given the way that we've designed things. So as a form of enlightened self-interest and a form of selfishness, I think we need to rethink those two um, ideas. The, one of the things we've been thinking about within the IDRC is what are the approaches to accessibility and inclusive design that really haven't worked? And one of them, as I was mentioning, is this notion of clustering. Um, the problem with categories is you're always gonna leave somebody out. And if for those two friends that I was talking about, um, they don't fit the disability categories that are available and it does become their fault or it, it is uh, blamed on them as though it is their fault. And they feel even more ex um, excluded and stranded. And they're not the only ones. There's many people that are falling through the cracks and stranded at the edges of the sort of protected groups that we've created. The other thing that doesn't work is um, our diversity and inc inclusion policies that don't change the game. 
Um, I, I think inclusion and diversity policies, especially within HR, and this is a whole other topic that I could spend another hour talking about, but um, what, what we're saying is that everybody, yes, you can, you have equal chance of getting into our company. We welcome, but wh what is that welcome made of when we're not also rethinking many of the constructs that we're welcoming people into? And what I have for the, anyone that can't see the slide, I have a, a wonderful cartoon that Seppi, a graphic designer, in our group made that basically says that we follow all HR policies, all you have to do is fit this mold. And of course the mold only fits um, one particular specific group that is very much like the person saying that you're all welcome. So the, the, the next question that I wanted to ask is where do we find real innovation? And um, of course there, is I, I think certainly within the inclusive design and accessibility community, there's an idea that we've been uh, promoting for quite some time that uh, many of you will probably know, and that's the curb cut effect. Um, that designing for that ragged edge, thinking about those 20%, not leaving them out, not thinking that uh, we can design everything for a mass or, or a majority um, has, some very, very powerful effects in terms of innovation. And um, you can, um, Steve Jacobs has created a whole list of things that uh, are called electronic curb cuts. Um, they actually, does anyone here not know what we mean by the curb cut effect? Okay, <laughs> then I'll explain it. Basically, curb cuts are those ramps on sidewalks, and they're designed for people with in wheelchairs, but of course they work better for everyone, whether you're on a skateboard or you're pushing a baby carriage or whatever. The notion is that if you design for somebody at the edge or you design for someone with a disability, then um, it's gonna benefit everyone. The there are many, many of these examples in our field, whether it's the typewriter, the telephone, the headsets, the loudspeaker, email, OCR, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, and it goes on and on and on. Almost all of them, were, there was an impetus based upon thinking about that 20% and not treating people as this large mass. And um, I, lo I love this. I have a picture of um, Vint Cerf and Tim Berners-Lee, and one has a T-shirt, I invented the web and I invented the internet, um, Vint. And... Um, it, if you want to discuss this particular phenomenon better, you should have conversations with both of them because they can both trace how, in fact, almost every wonderful innovation, everything that made things sustainable and work has come in some way from attempting to address the challenges of people that are at the edge. And um, there's... Uh, also, a book that just came out by Rich Donovan, which talks about return on disability. Um, if you're uh, thinking about economic curb cuts, and he's created an index um, which is based on the performance of companies with respect to disability, and he's, he's proven that those that uh, take care of that edge, that jagged edge of their customers and uh, make take several measures are like more likely to perform well one one of the things that comes from each of these is this lesson that um, eventually and more broadly if you look not just in the short term if you look more broadly beyond the particular customer that you seem to be focused on um, at a system level thinking about the edge uh, decreases cost, increases innovation, allows for a greater dynamic resilience, generosity. And uh, one of the things that seems obvious when you start to rethink it is that innovation is found at the edge, not at the conventional, comfortable, complacent middle. And it also, uh, from an economics perspective, not only will it improve profit, but it will uh, reduce cost over time. We've been, we've done a comparison of services, um, public services, where they thought about the entire group and worked with individuals at the edge versus uh, services that planning for the center. And the end of life came much more quickly if you plan simply for the center. It may cost less at the beginning, it may take less time to be up, but it will start to break down because you'll keep bolting on 
to address the things that you haven't thought about as were if you plan for, for the edge and with the edge at the beginning, then you're going to, it may cost more, may take a little bit more time, but you're going to be much more resilient. So what ha for us within the IDRC on our 25th anniversary has stood the test of time. Um, one of the things is uh, right from the beginning, we've, from a design perspective, we've seen disability as a mismatch, a mismatch between the needs of the individual, the product, the service experience or environment offered. And so um, we haven't sequestered particular um, or categorized or uh, those sorts of things. And we recognize that everybody can experience a disability. And one of the things we've been thinking about lately is the disability of poverty, because poverty, if you think about it, certainly in our society, our society is not built for poverty. And um, there are many, many mismatches that can be experienced. Um, I've put together this framework for the IDRC called the three dimensions of inclusive design. And it's not intended to be a containing or constraining thing. It's intended to be just a scaffold. And there's three things, three perspectives that we consider. One is that we're all unique, we're all diverse. And what we need to strive for is one size fits one for everybody, recognizing diversity um, in an integrated way and producing self-knowledge. Uh, making ourselves smarter about our uniqueness as well as, or perhaps rather than machine smarter. The second um, uh, is that we need an inclusive process. We need to continuously think about how inclusively designed is the table that we're working on, whether, I mean, uh, that we're working at, whether it's a policy decision table or a design table, who are we missing? And the individuals that we need to bring to the table are the people that have difficulty or can't use the, the current design. That's where we'll find innovation. And then lastly, we've been thinking a lot about thinking in systems, uh, producing benefit for all, uh, interventions in complex adaptive systems, because we can't just deal with isolated problem. We have to think about how the, our particular thing that we're working on fits within a system. You can't just make um, a particular curriculum piece work for a student unless you, you address the needs of the teacher and the needs of the principal, the school system, the provincial ministry of education. It'll break down the point of friction um, that occurs where you haven't considered uh, uh, the nested context is where it will break down. And so, um, and as I was saying, the um, your co-designers need to be the individuals who have difficulty using the design or can't use the design, those people at the jagged edge. The other thing that we've learned is that inclusive design is a process. It's not a product. It's not something you complete or that has a termination. The issues that individuals at that jagged edge face are not fixable. There's not a solution. You have It's, it's an ongoing process. And so the only way that we're going to address it, we can't dismiss someone and say, here, now I've, I've pro provided an app or a widget that's going to solve all of your issues. Um, and we're also not seeking to scale by replicating, but by diversifying. We're not going to find the magic bullet. We're going to find an approach that then needs to evolve and change and continuously respond. And so what we're attempting to create are systems um, as opposed to solutions. And we've learned to be aware of what we call, uh, what's called the COBRA effect, the unintended consequences of oversimplistic solutions to complex problems. One other very quick and I know, um, example, I went into a school um, where they were very, very proud that they had created an accessible test. And they led me and introduced me to a kid who was using a head switch. He had one reliable movement. He was using a head switch. And he was able to do the numeracy and literacy test um, independently. What I discovered was he was having to hit 32, the switch 32 times and go through a matrix, scanning matrix 32 times for any one question. And so the cognitive load of that simplistic solution to uh, accessibility was um, a definite COBRA effect. So one of the things we are very, very careful about is COBRA effects. 
and look up Cobra Effects on, um, to learn the amazing backstory. It's a story about India. Um, the other thing we learn from are from and uh, is systems thinking. And one person that I would recommend you to and ignore all of the text that's up there is, is Dana Meadows, who talks about um, the ways in which you can intervene in a complex adaptive system. But we are also looking at the philosophy of, of as if. Um, Hans Beyinger, he was a preeminent 20th century philosopher of modeling. And um, in the Mozilla room, we were talking about modeling and simulations and using data to model. Um, he, uh, his philosophy was brought up again by Adrian Clarkson. This notion of as is, is when we behave as if we care about each other, as if we encourage everyone to be part of a group, as if we are equal. We are actually living a metaphor when we live as if the as if can become actual reality. And we've been within the IDRC experimenting with what if. What if one size fits one for everyone, not segregated, separate, or special, but promoting self-knowledge, optimal fit for a goal, not necessarily comfortable fit, and also personal data preferences uh, as they relate to privacy. So giving people the control and recognizing their particular personal requirements. And what I'm showing here is, is a, a tool we call UI options, which I would um, welcome you to take a look at. We've also been exploring what if in terms of education through projects like our flow project or social justice repair kit. Um, valuing and fostering variability within students, collaboration, learning to learn, addressing educational mismatch. And here we've been trying to create an ecosystem that supports the students that, that are at the very margins and at the edge. We've been looking at platforms and the um, both the risks and opportunities that platforms mention or uh, provide. Uh, we've been experimenting with platforms for quite some time before they became part of the common vernacular. Uh, we were looking at ways to connect consumers at the edge with producers and suppliers at the edge to address the gaps in markets. And now we're looking at non-extractive platforms governed and owned by the workers together with Trevor Schultz and others at the New School. Um, we've been looking at um, other models for an accessible society. How do we move from obligation to participation within a legal framework? So we're working with a number of um, policy shops and, and governments who are looking at accessibility le legislation. And um, because underlying almost everything that we embark upon is planning and impact measurement and uh, determining whether we're successful, we're also looking at um, alternatives to the Gantt and Pert chart, measuring diverse distributed diverse impact, because that's how we're, we're usually judged by impact, but the way that we're judged really doesn't fit well with how we do things. And um, so we've created this notion of a virtuous tornado, where um, what we do is we iterate to stretch to the edge, as opposed to um, resolving towards, the, towards a one particular solution. And we're experimenting with what if smart inclusive communities, co-designing the communities we want, addressing the opportunities and risks for edge members is where we want to start. So uh, we're working with Waterfront and Sidewalk and various others that are experimenting with smart communities. And we put out the challenge that the way to build trust and the way to deal with privacy is to address the needs of individuals who are at the edge because there's the greatest opportunity to do something very compelling. And there's also, if you address the individuals at the edge, then you will address the, the worries and the trust issues that the rest of the population has or the rest of the community has. Um, I'm also, and I'm not going to get into this because that's, again, is a huge, is uh, what if data, evidence, and learning. But I've been taking those um, insights about the Gaussian curve and looking at how can we um, use population data for inferences within artificial intelligence without ignoring the outliers. So how do we make create an artificial intelligence system that's not going to run over my friend that goes backwards through the intersection? And of course, it, it applies to all sorts of things. If you look at the Uber accident, it was because of an edge scenario. And edge scenarios are the things that are going to either sink or swim 
the, our artificial intelligence and many of the innovations that we're working on. And so I've been looking at things like apple coring the data, learning um, with the edge as opposed to the middle or without the middle. And what I've discovered is that it transfers better. Um, I've also, and at some point, asked me about the lawnmower of justice. And basically, this is um, cutting off the top of the Gaussian curve so that there's no more than four or six repeats of a particular data set and what that does to an AI engine. We are also working on augmented reality data and modeling, escaping the data of the past. Of course, um, one of the things with data and big data is that it's all about the past. And so we're replicating, amplifying, uh, and automating the past. So we're looking at instead combining that data with imaginaries, modeling. And one of the things we're looking at is, is Jane Jacobs' walk, where you can use data from other communities, data about your community, but also modeling as if scenarios. Scenarios. Um, and to conclude, um, there may not be a free lunch, but there is the abundance of the potluck, the reciprocal generosity of a community, the soft landing afforded by a well-tended commons when you do fall out of that 20% or 80%, and the um, innovative evolution of a healthy ecosystem. And that's what we want to work on. And we would love to collaborate more with Mozilla on this. Um, and so your part um, is don't ignore the difficult 20%. Don't design for the average, design, design with the edge. Don't just design for your customer base, design with people that have difficulty with or can't use your system. That's where you're going to find the, the greatest innovation. And don't do it as an afterthought. Do it from the start. Intelligence and design that understands, recognizes, and serves di diversity is better able to respond to the unexpected, detect risk, adapt to change, transfer to new contexts, as greater longevity may reduce disparity and may lift us out of our current ruts. And um, because I'm a professor, here are some books. Um, there are um, so thinking in systems, which is the primer by Danella Meadows. She died in the 80s, but her uh, wisdom and prescience. Is, is quite amazing. The Spirit Level by Wilkinson and Pickett, well before Piketty, they were looking at the data that supports the fact that an equal society is better for everyone. The Real World of Technology by Ursula Franklin. Um, you'll be absolutely shocked at how well she predicted some of the issues that we're, we're facing right now. The Difference by Scott Page. Um, the End of Average by Todd Rose, who uh, uh, deconstructed the, the average man uh, in a book last year, the Unleashed Difference, which was just um, released by um, Rich Donovan and Mismatch by Kat Holmes, which isn't out yet, but which will be. She was the design lead at Microsoft that started the inclusive design department. And I would love to continue the conversation. I have some links, but I can provide more links. Actually, they're not very visible links, um, but um, you can... I can give you my card and we can continue the conversation. Thank you, Yuta. <laughs> um, so we'll take questions in the room as well as in the speaker series channel on Slack. Does anyone have any questions? That's a great talk. Um, I wanted to, I was wondering actually, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, minimum viable or minimum valuable products? Um, and the context is, I was, watch, I was watching this debate unfold, uh, I think it was on Reddit, about how the Apple Watches don't have a pregnancy mode. And so the Apple Watches don't have a pregnancy mode. So women in the past have usually just turned off uh, their watches when they get pregnant because it starts screaming at them that you're putting on weight, you're getting fat, uh, you're not exercising enough. Um, and there were two camps uh, in the debate. One camp was we can't design for everyone. We have to put out a minimal viable product um, and we will add these features over time. The other camp was saying that, well, you need more women in your uh, product design decision making so that we can uh, sort of uh, channel this into that regular product. And so I just looking okay. at your talk, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on getting that MVP out. Right. So um, one of the things that we've learned is that if you go for the typical average, you're not, it, it, we 
propose the notion of stretching to the edge. And so what would have hurt that minimum viable product if what you had started was with someone who doesn't have a current product that works for them? So perhaps it could have been a number of those individuals that were edge cases, including individuals, who, uh, women who are pregnant. I mean, the, 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 the Apple Watch isn't this huge success, right? I mean, it, it, there weren't enough compelling huge differences or innovations that it brought about. But think about uh, the, that Apple Watch having thought about individuals for whom there were huge gaps in the market. There was nothing on the market that could address their requirements. Imagine if they had um, created it or designed it for women who were pregnant, for women or for individuals who were, I don't know, um, sleep deprived all the time or people who had jet lag and had to, I mean, there are so many edge cases that I could think of that would make a really exciting um, Apple Watch. Um, I, I think the, you're not giving up the average or the typical or the middle, because they're they're already to some extent well served. And whatever you create for those edge users, as long as you have a diversity of edge users, um, is going to serve their purposes as well. But you are going to come up with a much more compelling use case, and you're going to address those things that sync things. Like think about all of the. Um, I mean the. Auto automated vehicle, it, it got sunk because it didn't think about the edge case. New technology requires trust and it requires buy-in and it requires uh, getting adoption. You're, the, all of those risks to adoptions, those things that can go really, really badly wrong are going to come from the edge. They're the weak signals. That's where you see what the risks are and that's also where you see um, what the opportunities are. Just a reminder, if you've got questions, um, ask them in Slack and speaker series. Is there anyone else here who has a question? I've got a question. Okay, great. <laughs> um, your advice around inclusive design was think about it from the beginning, don't bolt it on as an afterthought. I see a bunch of people here from different product teams who might not have been taking an inclusive design approach from the beginning of their product development. What advice would you give people who are wanting to incorporate that <clears throat> that methodology into the work they're doing to persuade the other people or to <laughs> i i would i mean whatever your motivation whatever it is that's your priority in terms of project planning in terms of the design that you're doing in terms of the development there are really really compelling arguments for using inclusive design um, whether it's cost whether it's innovation whether it's um sustainability, whether it's resilience, whether it's adoption, all of, uh, all of those have really great arguments. So list, ask them to list their priorities and then um, come to me and I'll give you <laughs> a good argument for why you should uh, consider inclusive design right from the beginning. Awesome, any other questions? I'm gonna check Slack one more time. Check the Twitter. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Utah, for coming today. Um, for folks here and online, if you're interested in these topics, you can continue the conversation in the accessibility or diversity channels on Slack. Uh, I know the UX team has also been doing some accessibility work, and some of their workshop videos will be available online next week. Talk to Heather McGraw if you've got questions. And Utah, I just want to thank you again. Big hand for Utah. And big hand for oh, big hand for David and Tara for uh, keeping the inclusive design going here. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a great afternoon. Bye.